The following is a conversation with Colin Engel. He's the CEO and co-founder of iRobot, a robotics company that for 29 years has been creating robots that operate successfully in the real world. Not as a demo or on a scale of dozens, but on a scale of thousands and millions. As of this year, iRobot has sold more than 25 million robots to consumers, including the Roomba vacuum cleaning robot, the Bravo floor mopping robot, and soon the Terra lawn mowing robot. 29 million robots successfully operating autonomously in real people's homes, to me, is an incredible accomplishment of science, engineering, logistics, and all kinds of general entrepreneurial innovation. Most robotics companies fail. iRobot has survived and succeeded for 29 years. I spent all day at iRobot, including a long tour and conversation with Colin about the history of iRobot, and then sat down for this podcast conversation that would have been much longer if I didn't spend all day learning about and playing with the various robots in the company's history. I'll release the video of the tour separately. Colin, iRobot, its founding team, its current team, and its mission has been and continues to be an inspiration to me and thousands of engineers who are working hard to create AI systems that help real people. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on iTunes, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D-M-A-N. And now, here's my conversation with Colin Engel. In his 1942 short story, Runaround, from his iRobot collection, Isaac Asimov proposed the three laws of robotics in order, don't harm humans, obey orders, protect yourself. So two questions. First, does the Roomba follow these three laws? And also, more seriously, what role do you hope to see robots take in modern society and in the future world? So the three laws are very thought-provoking and require such a profound understanding of the world a robot lives in, the ramifications of its action and its own sense of self, that uh, it's not a relevant bar, at least it won't be a relevant bar for decades to come. And so uh, if Roomba follows the three laws, and uh, I believe it does, uh, you know, <laughs> it is designed to help humans not hurt them. It's designed to be inherently safe. And uh, we design it to last a long time. It's not through any AI or intent on the robot's part. Uh, it's because following the three laws is aligned with being a good robot product. <laughs> so um, so I guess it does, but <laughs> it not, does. By, uh, not by explicit design. So then the bigger picture, what role do you hope to see robotics, robots take in our, what's currently mostly a world of humans? We need robots to help us continue to improve our standard of living. We need robots because the average age of humanity is increasing very quickly and simply the number of people young enough and spry enough to care for the elder growing demographic is inadequate. And so what is the role of robots? Today, the role is to make our lives a little easier, uh, a little cleaner, maybe a little healthier. But in time, robots are going to be the difference between real gut-wrenching declines in our ability to live independently uh, and maintain our standard of living and a future that is the bright one where we have more control over our lives, can spend more of our time focused on uh, activities we choose. And um, I'm so honored and excited to be playing a role in that journey. So you you give me a tour. You showed me some of the long history. It's now twenty nine years that iRobot I has been at it, creating 
some incredible robots. He showed me Packbot. Uh, he showed me a bunch of other stuff that led up to Roomba, that uh, led to uh, Brava and Terra. So let's skip that incredible history in the interest of time, because we already talked about it. I'll show this incredible footage. You mentioned elderly and robotics and society. I think the home is a fascinating place for robots to be. So where do you see robots in the home? Currently, I would say, once again, probably most homes in the world don't have a robot. So how do you see that changing? Where do you think is the big initial mm -hmm. value add that robots can do? So iRobot has sort of over the years narrowed in on the home, the consumer's home as the place where we want to innovate and deliver tools that will help a home be a more automatically maintained place, a healthier place, a safer place, and perhaps even a more efficient place to be. And uh, you know, today we vacuum, we mop, soon we'll be mowing your lawn, but where things are going is when do we get to the point where the home, not just the robots that live in your home, but the home itself becomes part of a system that maintains itself and plays an active role in uh, caring for and helping the people live in that home. And I, I see everything that we're doing as steps along the path toward that future. So what are the what are the steps? So, if we can s summarize some of the history of Roomba, the you've mentioned and maybe you can elaborate on it, but you mentioned that the early days were really taking a robot from something that works either in the lab or something that works in the field that helps soldiers uh, do the difficult uh, work they do to actually be in the hands of consumers and uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of robots that don't break down over mm -hmm. how much people love them over months of very extensive use. So that was the big first step. And then the second big step was the ability to sense the environment, to build a map, to localize, to be able to build a picture of the home that the human can then attach labels to in terms of you know, giving some semantic knowledge to the robot about its environment. Okay, so that's like a huge, two big, huge steps. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can comment on them, but also what is the 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 next step of uh, of making a robot part of the home? Sure. So the goal is to make a home that that takes care of itself, takes care of the people in the home, and gives a user an experience of just living their life, and the home is somehow doing the right thing, turning on and off lights when you leave, cleaning up the environment. And we went from robots that were great in the lab, but were both too expensive and uh, not sufficiently capable to ever do an acceptable job of anything other than being a toy or a curio in your home to something that was both affordable and sufficiently effective to drive, you know, be above threshold and drive purchase intent. Now we've disrupted the entire vacuuming industry. The number one selling vacuums, for example, in the US are, are Roombas, so not robot vacuums, but vacuums, and that's really crazy and weird. And, and, and that's, we need to pause on I mean, that's incredible. I, that's that's uh, it's incredible that a robot is 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 the number one selling thing that does something. Uh, yep, <laughs> something <they're>... as essential <laughs> as vacuuming. Yep. So we're we're, we're congratulations. Th <laughs> Thank you. I, it's still it's kind of fun to say, but the uh, just because this was a a, a crazy idea yeah. that that just started, you know, in a room here, um, we we're like, do you think we can do this? Well, <laughs> hey, let's give it a try. But. Um, but now the robots are starting to understand their environment. And if you think about the next step, there's two dimensions. I've been working so hard since the beginning of, of iRobot to make robots are autonomous. 
that um, you know they're smart enough and understand their task enough that they, they can just go do it without human involvement. Now what I'm really excited and working on is how do I make them less autonomous? Meaning that the robot is supposed to be your partner, not this automaton that just goes and does what a robot does. And so that uh, if you tell it, hey, I just dropped some flour by the fridge in the kitchen, uh, can you deal with it? Wouldn't it be awesome if the right thing just happened based on that utterance? And to some extent, that's less autonomous because it's actually listening to you, understanding the context and intent of of the sentence, mapping it against its understanding of the home it lives in and knowing what to do. And so that's an area of uh, research. It's an area where we're starting to roll out features. You can now tell your robot to clean up the kitchen and it knows what the kitchen is and can do that. And that's sort of 1.0 of where we're going. The other cool thing is that we're starting to know where stuff is. And why is that important? Well. Robots are supposed to have arms, right? Data had an arm, Rosie had an arm, <laughs> yeah. Robbie the robot had an arm. I mean, robots sure. are, you know, they are physical things that move our, around in an environment and they're supposed to like do work. Yeah. And if you think about it, if a robot doesn't know where anything, where anything is, why should it have an arm? But with this new dawn of home understanding that we're starting to go enjoy, uh, I know where the kitchen is. I might in the future know where the refrigerator is. I might, if I had an arm, be able to find the handle, open it, and even get myself a beer. Obviously, that's one of the uh, true dreams of robotics is to have robots <laughs> bringing us a beer while we watch uh, television. But, yeah. um, you know, I think that that new category of tasks where physical manipulation, robot arms, is a just a, a, a potpourri of, of, of new opportunity and excitement. And you see humans uh, as a crucial part of that. So you kind of mentioned that, and I, I, I personally find that a really compelling idea. I think full autonomy can only take us so far, especially in the home. So you see humans as helping the robot understand or give deeper meaning to the spatial information. Right, it's, it, it's a partnership. The robot is supposed to operate according to descriptors that you would use to describe your own home. The robot is supposed to, in lieu of better direction, kind of go about its routine, which ought to be basically right and lead to a home-maintained uh, in a way that it's learned you like, um, but also be perpetually ready to take direction that would activate a different set of behaviors or actions to meet uh, a current need to the extent it could actually perform that task. So I got to ask you, I think this is a fundamental and fascinating question because iRobot has been a successful company and a rare successful robotics company. So Anki, Jibo, Mayfield Robotics with a robot curry, Sci-Fi Works, Rethink Robotics. These were robotics companies that were founded and run by brilliant people. But all very unfortunately, for at least for us roboticists, all went out of business recently. So why do you think they didn't last longer? Why do you think it is so hard to keep a robotics company alive? You know, I, I um, say this only partially in jest that back in the day before Roomba, you know, I was a, um, I was a high tech entrepreneur building robots, but it wasn't until I became a vacuum cleaner salesman that we had any success. <laughs> so, the, I mean, the point is, Technology alone doesn't equal a successful business. We need to go and find the compelling need where the robot that we're creating can deliver clearly more value to the end user than it costs. 
And it's this is not a marginal thing where you're looking at the skin and you're like, yeah, it's close. Maybe we can hold yeah. our breath and make it work. It's clearly more value than the uh, the cost of the robot to bring to, uh, you know in the store. And I think that the challenge has been finding those businesses where that's true in a sustainable fashion. You know, the, the, um, when you get into entertainment style things, you could be the cat's meow one year, but 85% of toys, regardless of their merit, fail to make it to their second season. It's just super hard to do so. And um, uh, so that that's just a tough business. And there's been a lot of experimentation around um, what is the right type of social companion? What is the right robot in the home that is doing something other than tasks people do every week that they'd rather not do. And I'm not sure we've got it all figured out right. And so that you get brilliant roboticists with super interesting robots that ultimately don't quite have that magical user experience uh, and thus the that value benefit equation remains ambiguous. So you as somebody who dreams of robots, you know, changing the world. What's your estimate? Why, wh how big is the space of applications that fit the criteria that you just described where you can really demonstrate an obvious significant value mm -hmm. over the alternative non-robotic solution? Well, I think that we're just about none of the way <laughs> to achieving the potential of robotics at home. But we have to do it in a a really eyes wide open, honest fashion. And so, so another way to put that is the potential is infinite, because we did take a few steps. But you're saying those steps are just very initial steps. So the Roomba is a hugely successful product, but you're saying that's just the very very that's beginning. just the very very beginning. It's the foot in the door, yeah. and uh, you know I think I was lucky that in the early days of, of, of robotics, people would ask me, when are you gonna clean my floor? It was something that I grew up saying, I got all these really good ideas, but everyone seems to want their floor clean. Right. And so you're maybe we should do that. <laughs> and then yeah, your good ideas. Earn are... the right to do the next thing after that. So the good ideas have to match with the desire of the people and then, the actual cost has to like the business, the the financial aspect has to all match together. Yeah, I, I um, during our partnership back a number of years ago with Johnson Wax, they would explain to me that they would go into homes and just watch how people lived and try to figure out what were they doing <laughs> that they really didn't really like to do but they had to do it frequently enough that it was top of mind and, and uh, understood as a, um, uh, a burden. Hey, let's make a product yeah. uh, or, or come up with a solution to make that pain point less, ex less challenging. And, and sometimes we do certain burdens so often as a society that we actually don't even realize, like it's actually hard to see that that burden is something that could be removed. So it does require just going into the home and staring at, wait, how do I actually live life? What are the pain points? Yeah, and it, getting those insights is yeah. a lot harder than it would seem it should be in retrospect. So how hard on that point, I mean, one of the big challenges of robotics is driving the cost to something, driving the cost down to something that consumers, people would afford. So people would be less likely to buy a Roomba if it costs $500,000, right? 
which is probably sort of what a Roomba would cost several decades ago. So how do you drive, which I imagine is very difficult, how do you drive the cost of a Roomba or a robot down such that people would want to buy it? When I started building robots, the cost of the robot had a lot to do with the amount of time it took to build it. And so that we would build our robots out of aluminum. I would go spend my time in the machine shop uh, on the milling machine, cutting out the, 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 the parts and, and so forth. And then when we got into the toy industry, I realized that if we were building at scale, I could determine the cost of the robot instead of adding up all the hours to mill out the parts, but by weighing it. <laughs> and that's liberating. You can say, wow, um, the world is, has just changed as I think about construction in a different way. The 3D CAD tools that are available to us today, the um, uh, operating at scale where I can do tooling and injection mold an arbitrarily complicated part, and the cost is going to be basically the weight of the plastic in that part is incredibly exciting and liberating and opens up all sorts of opportunities. And for the sensing part of it, uh, where we are today is instead of trying to build skin, which is like really hard, for a long time I, I, I spent uh, creating strategies and, and ideas around how could we duplicate the skin on, on, on the human um, body because uh, it's such an amazing sensor. Yeah. The, um, uh, instead of going down that path, why don't we focus on vision and how many of the problems that face uh, a robot trying to do real work could be solved with a cheap camera, and a big ass computer. <laughs> yeah. And Moore's law continues to work. Yeah. The cell phone industry, the mobile industry is giving us better and better tools that can run on these embedded computers. And I think we passed a uh, an important moment maybe 2 years ago where you could put machine vision capable processors on robots at consumer price points. And I was waiting for it hap to happen. We had avoided putting lasers on our robots to do uh, navigation uh, and instead spent years researching how to do uh, vision-based navigation because uh, you could just see it where uh, these technology trends were going. And um, between injection molded plastic and a camera with a computer capable of running machine learning and visual object recognition, I could build an incredibly affordable, incredibly capable robot, and that's gonna be the future. So, you know, on that point with a small tangent, but I think an important one, another industry in which, I would say the only other industry in which there uh, there is automation actually touching people's lives today, is autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. What the vision you just described of using computer vision and using cheap camera sensors, that's there's a debate on that of LIDAR versus computer vision. And uh, sort of the Elon Musk famously said that uh, LIDAR is a crutch that really in camera in the long term, camera only is the right solution, which echoes some of the ideas you're expressing. Of course, the domain in terms of its safety criticality is different. But what do you think about that approach in uh, the autonomous vehicle space? And in general, do you see a connection between the incredible real world challenges you have to solve in the home with Roomba? And I saw a demonstration of some of them, corner cases, literally, and uh, autonomous vehicles. So there's absolutely a tremendous overlap between both the problems, you know, a robot vacuum and autonomous vehicle are trying to solve and the tools and the types of sensors that are being applied uh, in the pursuit of the solutions. In my world, my environment 
is actually much harder than the environment in automobile travels. We don't have roads. We have t-shirts. We have steps. We have a near infinite number of, of patterns and colors and, and surface textures on the floor. Especially from a visual perspective. So yeah, the way visually the it looks it's really tough. Is un, un, infinitely uh, variable. On the other hand, safety is way easier on the inside. My, my robots, they're not very heavy. They're not very fast. If they bump into your foot, you think it's funny. And, uh, you know, and, and um, uh, autonomous vehicles kind of have the inverse problem. Right. And so that for me saying vision is the future, I can say that without reservation. For autonomous vehicles, I think I believe what Elon's saying about the future is ultimately going to be vision. Maybe if we put a cheap lighter on there as a backup sensor, it might not be the worst idea in the world. So the stakes um, are much higher. The stakes so are much higher. You have to be much more careful thinking through how far away that future is. Right. Right. And but I think that the primary environmental understanding sensor is going to be a visual system. Visual system. So on that point, well, let me ask, do you hope there's an iRobot robot in every home in the world one day? I expect there to be at least one iRobot robot in, at in least. every home. You know, we're, we've, we've sold 25 million robots. Uh, so we're in about 10% of US homes, which is a great start. But I think that when we think about the, the numbers of things that robots can do, you know, today I can vacuum your floor, mop your floor, cut your lawn, or soon we'll be able to cut your lawn. Um, but there are more things that we could do in the home. And I hope that we continue using the techniques I described around exploiting computer vision and low cost manufacturing that we'll be able to create these solutions uh, at affordable price points. So let me ask on, on that point of a robot in every home, that's my dream as well. I'd love love to see that. I, I, you know, I think the possibilities there are indeed infinite, positive possibilities. But you know, in our current culture, no thanks to science fiction and so on, there's um, a serious kind of hesitation, anxiety, concern about robots and also a concern about privacy. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating question to me, uh, why that concern is amongst a certain group of people is as intense as it is. So you, you have to think about it because it's a serious concern, but I wonder how you address it best. So from a perspective of a vision sensor, so robots that move about the home and sense the world, how do, um, how do you alleviate people's privacy concerns? How do you make sure that they can trust iRobot and the robots that they share their home with? I think that's a great question. And we've really leaned way forward on this because given our vision uh, as to the role the company intends to play in the home, really for us, make or break is can our approach be trusted to protecting the data and the privacy of, of the people who have our robots. And so we've gone out publicly with a privacy manifesto stating we'll never sell your data. We've adopted GDPR, not just where GDPR is required, but globally. We have ensured that any that images don't leave the robot. So processing data from the visual sensors happens locally on the robot and only semantic knowledge of the home with the consumer's consent is sent up. We show you what we know and are trying to go use data as an enabler for the performance of the robots um, with the informed 
consent and understanding of the people who own those robots. And, you know, we take it very seriously. And ultimately, we think that by showing a customer that, you know, if you let us build a semantic map of your home and know where the rooms are, well, then you can say, clean the kitchen. Right. Uh, if you don't want the robot to do that, don't make the map. It'll do its best job cleaning your home, but it won't be able to do that. And if you ever want us to forget that we know that it's your kitchen, you can have confidence that we will do that for you. So we're trying to go and be a sort of a data 2.0 perspective company where we treat the data that the robots have as of the consumer's home as if it were the consumer's data and that they have rights to it. So we think by being the good guys on this front, we can build the trust and thus be entrusted to enable robots to do more uh, things that are, are thoughtful. Do you think people's worries will diminish over time? Uh, as, a, as a society, broadly speaking, do you think uh, you can win over trust, not just for the company, but just the comfort of people have with AI in their home, enriching their lives in some way? I think we're in an inter interesting place today where it's less about winning them over and more about finding a way to talk about privacy in a way that more people can understand. I would tell you that today, when there's a privacy breach, People get very upset and then go to the store and buy the cheapest thing, paying no attention to whether or not the products that they're buying honor privacy standards or not. Right. Uh, in fact, if I put on the package of my Roomba, the privacy commitments that we have, I would sell less than I would if I did nothing at all. And that needs to change. So it's, it's not a question about earning trust, I think that's necessary but not sufficient. We need to figure out how to have a comfortable set of what is the grade A meet standard hmm. applied to privacy that customers can trust and understand and then use in their buying decisions. That will reward companies for good behavior and that will ultimately be how this uh, moves forward. And maybe uh, be part of the conversation between regular people about what it means, what privacy means. If you have some standards, you can say, you can start talking about who's following them, who's not, have more. Because most people are actually quite clueless about all aspects of artificial intelligence or data collection and so on. It would be nice to change that to, for people to understand the good that AI can do. And it's not some, uh, some system that's trying to steal all the most sensitive data. Yep. Do you uh, think, do you dream of a Roomba with human level intelligence one day? So you've mentioned a very successful localization and mapping of the environment, being able to do some basic communication to say, go clean the kitchen. Do you uh, see in your maybe more bored moments, um, once you get the beer, to sit back with that beer and have a chat on a Friday night with the Roomba about how your day went. So to your latter question, absolutely. To your former question as to whether a robot can have human level intelligence, not in my lifetime. You can have, you, you, you I think, think you can have a great conversation, a meaningful conversation with a robot without it having anything that resembles human level intelligence. And I think that uh, as long as you realize that conversation is not about the robot and making the robot feel good, that conversation is about you learning interesting things that make you feel like the conversation that you had with the robot is a pretty awesome way of learning something. Uh, and it could be about what kind of day your pet had. It could be about, you know, how can I make my home more energy efficient? It could be about, you know, if I'm thinking about climbing Mount Everest, what should I know? And that's a very doable thing. 
you know, but uh, if I think that that conversation I'm going to have with the robot is um, I'm going to be rewarded by making the robot happy, well, I could have a, just put a button on the robot that you could push and the <laughs> robot would smile and, and, and that sort of thing. So I think you need to think about the question in, in the, the right way. And, and robots can be awesomely effective at helping people feel less isolated, learn more about the home that they live in, and uh, fill some of those lonely gaps that we wish we were engaged learning cool stuff about our world. Last question. If you could hang out for a day with a robot from science fiction, movies, books, and safely pick, safely pick its brain for that day, who would you pick? Data. Data. From Star Trek. I think that um, A, Data's really smart. Data's been through a lot trying to go and save the galaxy. And um, I'm really interested actually in emotion and robotics. And I think he'd have a lot to say about that because I believe actually that emotion plays an incredibly useful role in doing reasonable things uh, in situations where we have imperfect understanding of what's going on. In social situations when there's imperfect information. In social situations, also in um, uh, competitive or dangerous situations that um, we have emotion for a reason. And so that ultimately, this my theory is that as robots get smarter and smarter, they're actually going to get more emotional mm -hmm. because That's you, you can't actually survive on pure logic because only a very tiny fraction of the situations we find ourselves in can be resolved reasonably with logic. Uh, and so I think Data would have a lot to say about that. And so I could find out whether he agrees. What, if you could ask Data one question that you would get a deep, honest answer to, what would you ask? What's Captain Picard really like? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's the perfect way to end it. Colin, thank you so much for talking today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure.